it is very important that you don't self-diagnose or diagnose somebody else. The clear and real diagnosis of ADHD really should be carried out by a psychiatrist, a physician, or a very well-trained clinical psychologist. There are clear criteria for what constitutes full-blown ADHD. However, many of us have constellations of symptoms that make us somewhat like somebody with ADHD. And if you're struggling with focus nowadays, as a lot of people are, pay attention to the symptomology. You may actually require professional treatment. You might not. Equally important is to remember that some of the terms that we cover, like impulse control and attention and concentration, are somewhat subjective and they can change over time. Sometimes we have a better level of attention than others. Maybe it depends on how we slept or other events going on in our life or something that we're entirely unaware of. The important thing to remember is that we can all improve our attentional capacity. We can all rewire the circuits that make heightened levels of focus more accessible to us. So right now, the current estimates are that about one in 10 children and probably more have ADHD. Now, fortunately, about half of those will resolve with proper treatment, but the other half typically don't. The other thing that we are seeing a lot nowadays is increased levels of ADHD in adults. And there's some question as to whether or not those adults had ADHD that went undetected during their childhood or whether or not ADHD is now cropping up in adulthood due to the way that we are interacting with the world. For sake of today's discussion, attention, focus, and concentration are essentially the same thing. People with ADHD have trouble holding their attention. What is attention? Well, attention is perception. It's how we are perceiving the sensory world. So just a little bit of Neurobiology 101, we are sensing things all the time. There's information coming into our nervous system all the time. For instance, right now, you're hearing sound waves. You are seeing things. You are sensing things against your skin, but you are only paying attention to some of those. And the ones that you're paying attention to are your perceptions. So if you hear my voice, you are perceiving my voice. You are not paying attention to your other senses at the moment. But impulse control is something separate because impulse control requires pushing out or putting the blinders on to sensory events in our environment. It means lack of perception. Impulse control is about limiting our perception. People with ADHD have poor attention and they have high levels of impulsivity. They are easily distractible. But the way that shows up is very surprising. You might think that people with ADHD just simply can't attend to anything. They really can't focus. However, people with ADHD can have a hyper-focus, an incredible ability to focus on things that they really enjoy or are intrigued by. Typically, we think of somebody with ADHD as being really wild and hyperactive or having no ability whatsoever to sit still and attend. And while that phenotype, as we call it, that contour of behavior and cognition can exist, many people, if not all people with ADHD, if you give them something they really love, like if the child loves video games or if a child loves to draw or if an adult loves a particular type of movie or a person very much, they will obtain laser focus without any effort. So that tells us that people with ADHD have the capacity to attend, but they can't engage that attention for things that they don't really, really want to do. So you can imagine the challenges of exploring the role of diet and nutrition in any study, but especially in a study on ADHD. Why? Well, because as I mentioned before, children with ADHD, and it turns out adults with ADHD, tend to pursue sugary foods or any types of food that increase their levels of dopamine. They are naturally drawn to those foods, whether or not they realize it or not, presumably as a way to try and treat their lack of focus and impulsivity. So in this study that I'm about to share with you, there was no drug treatment. It was just a study manipulating diet and involved 100 children, 50 in the so-called elimination diet group, the special diet where certain foods were eliminated, and 50 in the so-called control group. This study also included a crossover, meaning where the, the kids would serve as their own control 
or control group at a certain portion of the study. So they would be in one group where they eliminated certain foods. And then after a period of time in the study, they would swap to the other group. This is a powerful way to design a study for reasons that you can imagine because you start to eliminate changes and effects due to individual differences. In this study, every single one of the effects is P less than 0.0001, very, very infinitesimally small probability that the effect observed could be due to chance. So what were these effects? These effects were enhanced ability to focus, less impulsivity, even less tendency to move when trying to sit still. So everything from mental focus to the ability to control their bodies improved when they were in the elimination diet group. What was eliminated? Well, the elimination diet in this particular study was a so-called oligoantigenic diet. It was a diet in which each kid took a test to determine which foods they had antibodies for, meaning that they were mildly allergic to. Now, in this study, it was very important that the kids not be extremely allergic to any food because, as I mentioned before, they actually served as a control at one point in the study where they were eating all sorts of foods, including foods that they had mild allergies to. So basically what this study said was that eliminating foods to which children have allergies can dramatically improve their symptoms of ADHD. And this study, not surprisingly, because it was published in such a high quality journal, Lancet, et cetera, large number of subjects, set the world on fire. People were extremely excited about these results because here in the absence of any drug treatment, there was a significant improvement in ADHD symptoms observed. And then came the criticisms. So many papers were published after this specifically dealing with reanalysis of these data. And I want to be fair in saying that the data in the paper look good, but there are criticisms of the overall structural design of the study. I don't want to go into all the details exactly because it gets really nuanced about some of the statistics and the way that one examines these types of data, but there was skepticism and in science, skepticism is healthy, especially when making decisions about whether or not to treat or feed children one food or another, or give them one drug or another. Elimination of simple sugars has a dramatic and positive effect. She's observed that over and over and over again in many dozens, if not hundreds of patients. Okay. Now that's not a peer reviewed study. That's a statement that I'm conveying to you anecdotally, but it's a highly, highly informed one. There's another camp that's starting to emerge in the peer reviewed scientific literature showing that when kids are not exposed to certain foods, in particular nuts and things of that sort, they develop allergies to those foods. And then when exposed to them later, they cause real problems. So there's a whole galaxy of discussion and controversy and outright fighting about allergies in kids and whether or not the oligoantigenic diet is the appropriate one. That paper was published in 2011. Since then, there have been many dozens of studies exploring the same thing, as well as meta-analyses of all those data. And it does appear that diet can have a highly significant role in eliminating or at least reducing the symptoms of ADHD. So much so that some of the children are able to not take medication at all or eventually wean themselves off medication as young adults and as adults. One interesting question is whether or not adults should modify their diet in order to increase their levels of focus if they're already having normal levels of focus but would like more or would like to reduce existing adult ADHD brings us right into the realm of what are called omega-3 fatty acids. I've talked many times on this podcast about the known benefits of omega-3 fatty acids, in particular, it getting a one gram, 1,000 milligrams or more, even as much as 2,000 milligrams each day of the so-called EPA component of omega-3 fatty acids, known to have antidepressant effects, mood elevating effects, known to have important effects protecting the cardiovascular system, I think it's now clear that the immune system also benefits that omega-3 fatty acids that include a gram or more of EPAs are very beneficial. Typically that's done through fish oil. Liquid fish oil is going to be the most cost efficient, but there are capsule forms. Omega-3s have shown, been shown to have all these positive health benefits. Do they have positive effects on focus and attention? And the answer is you can find studies that support that statement and the effects are significant, but the effects are modest. 
You can also find studies that show no effect. However, much like with omega-3s and antidepressants, whereby ingestion of omega-3 fatty acids of a gram or more of EPA per day allows people with major depression to get away with taking lower doses of antidepressant medication, it does seem that ingestion of omega-3 fatty acids in adults that include EPAs of 1,000 milligrams or more can allow adults with ADHD or mild attention deficit issues to function well on lower doses of medication and in rare cases to eliminate medication entirely. 